Good morning, Zhang Wei. Good afternoon, Jennifer, and a very good evening to Carlos and a good afternoon to Ivana. Welcome to the third episode of Making Reproductive Longevity a Reality. I'm Jennifer Garrison. I'm a faculty member at the Buck Institute and faculty director for the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. And at the consortium, we're trying to build the ecosystem around female reproductive health and equality through funding, through collaboration and dialogue between scientists. And this webinar series is really designed to highlight some of the research that we've funded. So today we're featuring two talks from GCRLE grantees on exciting topics related to female reproductive health, namely genome instability and diet and the microbiome. So Zhang Wei, I no doubt you have encountered some of these issues in your clinical practice with your patients. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Jennifer. So, um, hi, I'm Zhong Wei here. I'm a clinician scientist in Ops Op and Gynae, and I'm an IVF specialist. Um, and actually, my research focus has been trying to understand how aging affects the human oocytes, especially. And actually, during the PhD years, I was actually studying how aging affects the quality of human eggs. And one of the det detrimental effects that we notice is that the human eggs actually have high rates of what we call aneuploidy. That means the abnormal number of chromosomes to the genetic material that's going to pass down to the future uh, offspring. And this phenomenon seems to increase rapidly with age. And, and it seems to affect you know, aging effects on what we call the meiotic spindle. Uh, these proteins that separate the chromosomes apart. And it allows a very abnormal separation of these chromosomes, resulting in the abnormal number of chromosomes ultimately in the embryo that forms. And I was wondering how aging mechanisms, even like oxidative stress and DNA repair, actually affect the quality of these eggs as a woman ages itself. And furthermore, many women have asked me, you know, how about nutrient supplementation? What can I eat you know, during pregnancy and later life? You know, how, how do I ensure that I remain healthy during my pregnancy? How do you think my babies, my daughters will be healthy as well? And, and how, when I'm an older woman in my midlife, you know, can I still remain healthy? Is there anything for me to take to ensure that? So, and, right. and with that, I think it's a nice lead into what uh, Ivana is going to share with us. And because I understand Ivana is working in, this, uh, in Wu Sykes, human eggs, not human eggs, correction, eggs, <laughs> on understanding how uh, this phenomenon actually, uh, you know, leads to uh, reproductive aging. So Ivana is born in Croatia, where she received an undergraduate degree. She came to the United States to pursue a PhD, and she received a graduate and postdoctoral training at the John Hopkins School of Medicine. She is currently faculty in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Tulane University School of Medicine. And her research is focused on the molecular and cellular biology of long interspersed nuclear elements, line one retrotransposons, which are mobile DNA elements and impacts on host genomes. And currently, uh, what is known about this active line element in human and mouse genome is that it's an endogenous mut mutagen that can affect genomic instability. So the aging process seems to activate these elements. And so uh, Ivana is now going to explore the idea of how this contributes uh, to reproductive aging. Ivana, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar. Uh, today, I will introduce my uh, project that we are developing in the lab, and that was generously funded by Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. So what we are trying to understand, we are trying to understand the role for line one retrotransposons in female reproductive aging. And specifically, we are trying to understand uh, whether line one retrotransposon contribute to decline in also quality with age. So um, can we move to the next slide? Uh, thank you. So. Um, I, uh, as I think this slide is very familiar to everyone. Uh, we know that uh, 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 advanced maternal age lead to progressive decline in uh, fertility. And uh, this is an important uh, medical problem as uh, more women nowadays uh, delay uh, having children for career choices. And uh, central to this problem is a uh, decline in OSI quality. Uh, so understanding uh, all the molecular and cellular mechanism that leads to this decline is important to develop possible uh, intervention. So 
um, I think in this project, we'd like to explore whether uh, line one retrotransposons are a novel, previously non recognized uh, factor that leads to um, decline in all site quality. Um, so, uh, I'd like to start by introducing line one retrotransposon first. So, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, one more. <laughs> so, uh, line one retrotransposon belong to repetitive uh, mobile elements, with me, which means that they can move from one location in our genome to another one. And um, in line one retrotransposon is the only currently active uh, retrotransposon in the human genome. And as such, it's a potential source of uh, endogenous um, DNA damage. Uh, so, uh, after the human genome was sequenced, um, it um, uh, became apparent that uh, line one sequences comprise very large portion of the human genome, 17%. And uh, line one is the only uh, active autonomous retrotransposon in human genome, which means that encodes all the machinery necessary for retrotransposition and uh, as such also mobilizes uh, other retro retrotransposon sequences like uh, ALU and SVA. So if we take everything together, line one retrotransposon was uh, responsible for generation of about one third of our genome through evolution. Um, not all the sequences of the line one retrotransposon are active. Many of them are truncated, but we still have in our genome about 100 elements that can actively transpose and in the mouse genome, about 3,000 elements. And um, uh, maybe move to another. Um, yes, so what I wanna uh, show you here that it is estimated that uh, one new line insertion happens per 100 to 200 uh, live births, births, and then one new ALU insertion happens per 20 live births. And remember that ALU is also mobilized by uh, line one retrotransposon. So if you move to the next slide, um, uh, here I'm showing, uh, um, uh, just to introduce line one elements, a uh, simple structure of the line uh, one retrotransposon. So this is an element uh, six bases in length, and it's flagged uh, uh, by um, 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 a, a target site duplication on each end, which happens during the retrotransposition process. Uh, it contains five uh, prime and three prime UTR. Uh, five prime UTR untranslated region contains Lyman promoter, and um, uh, which actually mobilizes together with the uh, Line One messenger RNA. And uh, that way, Line One ensures that um, it, it carries its own promoter and ensures ex uh, transcription and transposition of the new element that is generated. Uh, line one element contains uh, two uh, uh, proteins, uh, ORF1 and ORF2. ORF1 is a RNA binding protein and uh, it's responsible for uh, assembly of uh, ribonuclear particles. Uh, it's also one that's more uh, abundant. So often when we uh, look at the line one expression by immunohistochemistry, this is what we uh, see in our sample samples. Uh, ORF2 contains uh, all the enzymatic activity uh, responsible for retrotransposition, which is endonuclease activity, which will cut DNA, and then uh, reverse transcriptase activity, uh, which will um, make uh, cDNA from uh, line one messenger RNA. And in this very simple schematics, I want to um, introduce the life cycle of the uh, uh, line one elements. So once they are transcribed, they are exported into cytoplasm, which the, where they are translated and assembled into ribonuclear particles that contains messenger RNA, uh, ORF1 and ORF2 protein, which is uh, subsequently imported again into nucleus, where endonuclease is going to make a, a, a cut in DNA at the 
the insertion site and use exposed um, uh, DNA to as a primer to extend uh, a synthesis of the uh, first DNA strands. Uh, subsequent steps, uh, second uh, cut uh, and uh, actual integration are a little less understood, but the final product of this reaction is a new copy of the line man uh, element at a different uh, genomic location. Um, so can we please move to another slide? Um, so um, I just want to illustrate here uh, uh, impact that line one can have on our genome and examples of some uh, genomic variations that are caused due to the uh, line one um, um, uh, transposition activity. So line one is essentially insertional mutagen and actually first copy of the line one that was active copy of the line one that was cloned was cloned for hemophilia patients where line one inserted into factor eight. Uh, in addition to being insertional mu mutagen, it can cause DNA breaks uh, that doesn't need to be uh, converted into insertional product, but can be um, uh, improperly repaired, or a line one can actually use uh, itself to repair pre-existing DNA breaks. Uh, it can generate uh, deletions in the genome. It can generate ectopic recombination that happens between um, different copies of the line one elements uh, that are um, uh, present at the different chromosomes. Also, it can cause uh, something called uh, transaction, uh, transduction, which uh, basically it's a mechanism where line one doesn't stop its transcription at its end, but proceeds into neighboring DNA. And then essentially during the transposition carries that DNA to from one genomic location uh, to another. So uh, because um, uh, also, I want to mention that in addition to effects on the DNA that uh, line one can have, recently it has been described that even just line one messenger uh, RNA can have potential deleterious function in the organism. So it, it's been shown that um, messenger RNA uh, can uh, uh, induce interferon response, which is seen in some auto-inflammatory diseases and aging itself. So uh, given uh, 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 all these potentially uh, deleterious effects on uh, our genome, uh, um, uh, host organisms for Lyme have developed uh, uh, strong uh, modes of repression, which are uh, mostly methylated through DNA methyl uh, methylation and heterochromatization of the Lyme promoter. And um, as a result of that, we don't see very much expression in, uh, of Lyme in the normal uh, somatic tissue, but in certain pathological situations, uh, we can see upregulation of L1. For example, many cancers uh, upregulate uh, L1s. So um, uh, can we move to another slide? So one of the uh, cells that show some uh, uh, level of expression of uh, line one are actually germ cells. So um, what I'm showing here that um, I want to show first what's happening with the male germ cells. So um, once uh, primordial germ cells have uh, uh, migrated to genital ridge and they uh, start their differentiation, uh, DNA methylation uh, uh, happens and uh, including DNA methylation of the line one promoter and um, uh, line ones are repressed in the male germ cells uh, 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 throughout the uh, later development. Can we uh, go to the next slide? So um, later uh, uh, it was reported that um, during spermatogenesis, uh, uh, line one can uh, be to some degree derepressed. De what you're looking see, uh, what you're looking here, are uh, different stages of uh, prof meiotic prophase, and um, you can see uh, uh, orphan protein of the line one detected by immunohistochemistry that can 
uh, be detected in the zygote and Parkinson stage. It's not very clear why this happens, but the idea behind this is that um, perhaps this is an opportunity of the Lyman to propagate into next generation. However, even under this condition, uh, this level of expression is controlled. Uh, male germ cells have developed very strong uh, mechanism uh, in the form of pyRNAs and pyRNA uh, pathway proteins to uh, repress to most extent uh, line one expression. And if we get another um, 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 slide, please. Um, yes, so uh, when this control is lost, uh, for example, uh, what I'm showing here is a uh, um, uh, one of the mutants in the pi RNA pathway, there is a huge upregulation of these uh, of line one elements, which uh, uh, end up causing a lot of DNA breaks in DNA. And as a result of that is, um, if we go further, please, uh, is a result of uh, a spermatocyte death and the male infertility. Uh, so this is what happens in the male germ cells. In the female germ cells, if we move to the next slide, um, uh, in the female germ cells, so uh, during embryonic development, line one is actually uh, expressed. So in that sense, it's different than um, uh, 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 line one in the male uh, germ cells. And what I'm showing here on the right is uh, uh, embryonic uh, ovary stained with the antibody detecting orphan protein and the germ cell marker. And as you can appreciate, there is a, quite a bit of expression of the um, um, uh, line one in this case. It's not clear what this really means, but it has been proposed that uh, line one may contribute to regulation of the fetal or atresia, which is a normal developmental process that shape our uh, starting oocyte pool. Um, uh, so line one repression in the female germ cells uh, uh, starts happening postnatally with the uh, uh, growing oocytes. It's uh, detected in the primary oocytes, and by the time oocytes develop, it's develop finish its development uh, um, to uh, germinal vesicle stage. Line one uh, elements are mostly methylated. What is happening uh, later? Uh, throughout the life uh, of the um, um, oocyte, uh, uh, how this repression is maintained, uh, it is not clear at this point. And uh, you can imagine that um, a long-lived cell like oocyte uh, could be uh, uh, very much sensitive to uh, any form of DNA damage, and this uh, uh, some of this damage could come from the line one retrotransposon in, in, if they uh, actually get uh, de-repressed. So uh, one of the, if we can move to another slide, please. Uh, one of the uh, condition where uh, it is very well established right now is uh, uh, aging. Aging leads to upregulation. Uh, of line one elements uh, through the changes of uh, status of DNA methylation and chromatin changes on the, of the line one pro uh, promoter. And I'm showing here uh, just a few pictures from a, a pretty big paper that was published a couple of years ago. So if you look at the left, you can see the picture of the human skin fibroblasts from the young and the old animals. And as I mentioned, in somatic tissue of the young animals, uh, line one is really not detectable. But as you can see in the fibrous blast of the old uh, uh, um, humans, um, you can uh, certainly detect expression of the line one uh, through using ORF1 antibody, which is one of the proteins encoded by L1. And this is also, if you can see on the right, uh, shown that it happens in the mouse. And it has been shown actually for the various somatic tissue. Um, so it is believed that in case of aging, um, uh, um, during the senescence that happens uh, uh, through in the aging process, there is a deregulation of the line one, and uh, this line one uh, causes uh, um, interferon response, inflammation, uh, um, um, 
and um, remarkably, uh, this they, uh, this was this effect was able to be um, um, reversed by a use of HIV reverse uh, transcriptase inhibitors, which uh, also works on work on um, uh, line one reverse uh, transcriptase. So, which would suggest that there is uh, potentially a direct role for uh, line one in the aging process. So. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, one more. So uh, what I would like to say here is that given that aging and uh, germ cell environments are two states that seem to be um, uh, supportive for uh, line one expression, uh, we hypothesize that during reproductive aging, there could be the repression of the line one elements, uh, which could lead to the decline in the oocyte quality. So. I'd like to just show you how we're trying to address this. Uh, we are still pretty much at the beginning, but um, if we move to the next slide, um, our approach essentially uh, involves uh, looking at the um, um, two aspects of the uh, uh, line one. We'd like to determine uh, the expression of the line one in uh, young and uh, aged oocytes, and uh, also try to see whether we can find a correlation with the total transcriptome, uh, whether there are certain pathways that uh, uh, could be upregulated as a response to line one upregulation, if we, of course, see one. Uh, so um, we are developing certain techniques that are um, uh, uh, tailored to detection of the line one elements because they are not very trivial to uh, detect in the uh, standard RNA-seq experiments because of uh, the reason that I mentioned before, there are so many copies in the genome and they are also very similar. So sometimes it's hard to distinguish whether the uh, RNA that we are de detecting is coming from proper full length um, line one or it's coming from uh, passive uh, transcription from some other gene. We are also trying to analyze whether there is an Increase in, of the insertion in the uh, uh, of the line one in the aged oocytes, and without going into details of this schematic, uh, we do have a method where we can specifically amplify junction between L1 and the neighboring genomic DNA and subject that to next generation sequencing to uh, see whether there is an increased uh, level of the new insertion. And I think that's interesting in addition to see whether um, there is an uh, increased number of insertion, which could shed some light uh, uh, the mechanism how L1 works. But also it's been shown, we would like to see whether there are certain sequences or regions of the chromosome where L1 likes to uh, insert. Uh, it's been shown that line one uh, uh, can participate in formation of the new centromere. So I think uh, it would be interesting to I explore the patterns of integration from uh, that perspective. And the, finally, if we go to the next slide, um, what we are trying to do, we are trying to uh, see whether transgenic animals that overexpress line one elements can be used as a mouse model of uh, reproductive aging. So. I have to say here that one of the problems that uh, researchers in the L1 field encounter try, uh, uh, trying to um, um, uh, interrogate effect of the line one of the host experiment is that it's very hard to determine uh, whether line one is a direct cause because we cannot uh, knock, knock line one sequences, knock out line one sequences, there are so many in the genome. So uh, there was some uh, success with the uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, but we have to keep in mind that they are not line one specific. So uh, they can work on the other uh, reverse transcriptases. So what we like to do, we would like to use a, a mouse model a mou that has a, a Orpheus transgene, which is engineered to express high level of uh, line one and uh, uh, in combination with the appropriate uh, uh, Cree, which uh, can 
uh, activate this uh, element in the tissue specific uh, manner. And in this case, we would activate this element in the primary uh, oocytes postnatally, which also give us opportunity to distinguish between effects of Lyme one postnatally versus uh, what has in, uh, been observed during embryonic development. So, so this is what we are trying to do. And with this, I would like to conclude and acknowledge um, um, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, acknowledge Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Quality because it would not be possible to do this work with their uh, support. And uh, I want to uh, uh, thank the, uh, this, uh, this time to Ms. Lalita Vedula, who is a technician who joined me a couple of months ago. So we are a very small team and we work very uh, closely together. Uh, Dr. Wenfeng An uh, has given me uh, Orpheus mice. And I'd like to thank uh, Tracy Zhu for, from Dr. Francesca Duncan at uh, Northwestern University, who taught me some of the techniques necessary to manipulate oocyte. And finally, Dr. Jeffrey Hahn, who is another L1 retrotransposon uh, researcher at Tulane University. We work very closely uh, on some other projects as well and share uh, space and equipment. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ivana. So that was really exciting. New work to be in. There are questions for you, but I have to hand over the time to Jennifer now because uh, we will answer all the questions later on. Thank you very much. So Jennifer, over to you. Yeah, that was fascinating, Ivana. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Carlos Rivera. He's a group leader at Champalimaud Neuroscience Program in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, he was born in Switzerland, and he did his PhD at the Biocentrum at the University of Basel, um, where he pioneered the use of 3D imaging to um, study developing embryos and understand how different cellular processes and forces actually shape organ development. Um, while he was an EMBO postdoctoral fellow at the IMP in Vienna, Austria, he got interested in trying to understand how nutrients might shape brain-body interactions and behavior. So in 2009, when he started his independent lab, uh, he moved to Lisbon and joined what was then a newly founded Champelimaud neuroscience program, where uh, he is now. So uh, Carlos's lab really works at the interface between behavior and physiology. And what he's interested in understanding is how metabolism and the microbiome, so the microbes in your gut, interact to regulate how organisms decide what to eat and how these decisions affect the overall health and well-being of the organism. Um, he's contributed greatly to our understanding of how nutrients and organismal physiology and reproductive states act both in the brain and in the periphery to control nutrient choice. Um, more recently, his lab has characterized how metabolic interactions among specific gut microbi uh, mi microbes regulate food cravings and reproduction. So um, his work is really characterized by uh, interdisciplinary studies. And I would say that like many of our uh, more senior grantees, he's really takes uh, mentoring and career development for his trainees seriously. So he actually requested from us that he share his grant with one of the senior scientists in his lab who we'll hear from later in the seminar series. Um, Carlos is also an international leader, so he's currently the Secretary General Elect of the Federation of European Neuroscience Societies. And today he's going to tell us how nutrients, the microbiome, and the reproductive state of animals act on the brain to alter food choice. So welcome, Carlos. Hi, Jennifer. Hello, everybody who's online now. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to be able to share our work. So let's do that. So yeah. Um, Carlos Ibero, I'm a group leader at Champagne-Mo, uh, a new institute, well, now not anymore, institute in Lisbon. And I'm going to talk to you today how we uh, study how nutrition, reproduction, and behavior work together to make sure that um, animals take in the nutrients they need and that they optimize their life span and reproduction. And also I'm going to tell you how we use actually this very powerful model system, which is the invertebrate system of Flamel Augusta, to really get at the mechanisms of how that works. But first, let me really, this is the most important slide of every talk for me, really thank the people in my lab. So this is the fantastic people with whom I really have the pleasure and honor to work with, a fantastic group of international scholars 
which work with me uh, to try to tackle these ambitious questions. And yeah, I would especially like to highlight and thank Zita Santos, who's the postdoc with whom we are being mentoring into this interface between reproduction uh, and metabolism and behavior. I would also like to thank our collaborators. Uh, these are the people which allow us to really do this interdisciplinary work by collaborating with us and sharing their newest techniques. And obviously also all our funders, especially the GCRLE and the Champagne Mall Foundation who are uh, really feeding us and our flags. And um, the place we work is here, the Champagne Mall Center for the Unknown, a state of the art uh, research and clinical center where scientists work at the interface of neuroscience, cancer, physiology, and uh, using different systems to try to understand how the whole organism works together and makes sure organisms stay healthy uh, or unfortunately when it be they become unhealthy, how we can recover that. And I really hope that when the pandemic is over, you all have time and come visit us. So what is it we want to understand? So if you look at food, food has many different types of nutrients. So some foods have more carbohydrates, some have more vitamins, some have more fat, and some of them have more proteins. And really what the challenge is for an organism is to make sure it eats all the nutrients it needs to eat and extracts these nutrients from the different types of foods. So animals have to be able to choose what type of food to eat so that they can reconstitute a balanced diet out of all these nutrients, which will optimize life history traits like aging, reproduction, and general well-being. And while we know a lot about certain nutrients, especially energy uh, giving nutrients like carbohydrates, there is actually still a lot of uh, unknowns when it comes to other nutrients like, for example, proteins. So we put the majority of our focus on understanding how animals keep a balanced amino acid, meaning protein uh, intake. And amino acids and proteins are really uh, interesting in terms of behavior and nutrition decisions because 10 of the 20 amino acids are essential, which means neither we nor most other animals like our flies can synthesize them. So we depend completely on choosing and, and eating them to be able to actually sustain all the bodily functions which require amino acids. And obviously because amino acids are the constituents of all proteins, we absolutely have to uh, eat them to make sure that all our cells are able to make proteins. So the way we started looking at how nutrients and reproduction might be interacting is by mapping out which nutrients have an impact on reproduction in Drosophila. And so this is what I'm plotting here. So what I'm plotting here is the average number of eggs a female will produce in one day. And what you see here is that we have a complete diet they will produce around 15 to 20 eggs per day. But if you remove sucrose, it's going to be already a decrease. And if you remove amino acids, which is what we do in this diet, then egg production completely collapses. So both carbohydrates and amino acids are essential for the female to be able to keep up a high reproductive rate. But also, for example, salt is very important. So if you take now a normal diet like we use it in the lab and you supplement it with increasing amounts of salt, we can significantly boost the reproductive output of these animals to a level which is almost double as under normal foods. So specific nutrients can have a high impact on the reproductive capacity of the female. So, well, that could be a very easy problem then to solve, right? Because all the animals could do is just completely overeat on nutrients which they get access to and make sure they have enough amino acids, sugar, and salt. But that doesn't really work. Because the problem is that if animals overeat certain nutrients, specifically amino acids, that will have a strong impact on aging. Because if animals overeat amino acids, and that's also been shown epidemiologically for humans, that will significantly shorten their, their lifespan. So if animals want to optimize their lifespan while keeping a high reproductive rate, they have to calculate the optimal trade-off between eating enough amino acids but not too much so that they will actually shorten lifespan. And the question is, how does that work? How does the brain make sure that the animal eats right? And how is that encoded in the brain? And that's, I would argue, is one of the big, big unsolved questions in biology, which is how does nutrition work? What's the impact of nutrients? 
And can we design specific diets which are optimal for people depending on their current needs? And just if you go into a library, go into Amazon and type in diet, well, you will see that there are around 10,000 books which will tell you what is the correct diet, and they're all slightly different, which tells you that actually we don't understand what is an optimal diet. And I would argue that that's one of the big frontiers in biology nowadays. So what we want to understand is how does the brain encode nutrition, and how does the brain make sure that the animal takes in all the required nutrients? And we work at the interface of neuron circuits, molecular mechanisms acting in the brain to make sure that the animal eats enough nutrients. We also manipulate and analyze the impact of nutrients on reproduction, as I've shown you, but also look at the microbiome because we have found out that that's an important factor impacting physiology and behavior. We use highly quantitative behavioral assays to really be able to see what changes in the behavior of the animal when we change the nutritional environment of the animal. We look at the effects of these mechanisms by looking at aging, reproduction, and general health markers in the animal. And we also look what happens when we modify the metabolism of the whole organism or organ physiology specifically, how that then talks back to the brain and changes nutrition. And we believe that it's at the intersection of these different uh, levels of mechanisms that we will get an integrated mechanistic understanding of how nutrition is regulated and impacts physiology. Such a highly interdisciplinary mechanistic project is difficult to do with most organisms, but that's really where invertebrate uh, model systems excel, because they are very easy to manipulate, especially genetically, and give us access to many, many, to the ability to do many, many different experiments, which means that we can really quickly go through many different variables and find out the ones which really matter. And the results we get are very impactful also to understanding um, human health, because most of the relevant disease genes, for example, which are known, are conserved from invertebrates through, uh, through humans, because these are the basic key, uh, key building blocks which evolution is using. But not only genes and, um, and, and um, um, molecular mechanisms are conserved, but also the general organization of organs and physiological re regulation is conserved between humans and Drosophila and invertebrates. So we can understand also the physiological regulatory mechanisms. And this has led to many, many important discoveries, which have been recognized by different awards, like, for example, multiple Nobel Prizes over the last 100 years, recognizing the impact of invertebrates research on human health. But let's get back to reproduction, right? So one thing which I think uh, is very well recognized, especially in the more anecdotal observation, is that when animals, including humans, are in a reproductive state, their physiology and their nutritional behavior and requirement changes. And that makes sense if you think that actually production of eggs, young and milk, requires a lot of extra resources. And these are mainly proteins, so that explains our effects of the minerals, but also sodium, right? Because we're making a lot of cells, and cells need to be filled with sodium to make sure that the ionic balance is kept. And so what's been shown is that sodium, especially, is really positively affecting reproduction in voles, mice, rats, butterflies, drosophila, whatever organism has been looked at. And so if protein, amino acids, and sodium is so important to keep up a high reproductive rate, could it be that the brain makes sure that the animal keeps a high level of intake of these nutrients? So does the brain solve this problem here in reproduction? And indeed, that's what we observe. So when we compare the intake of salt between virgin, so not reproductive females, and mated, meaning reproductively active females producing eggs, now these mated females will eat much more salt. And the same thing is if we give flies our choice. So if we give flies choice to eat either from protein or sugar, then mated females making eggs will prefer to eat protein, whereas virgin females, which are not reproductively active, will prefer to eat sugar. So mating, meaning becoming reproductively active, changes both salt, but also choice between sugar and protein. And I'm not gonna go through the details, but through multiple years of work, we have mapped out the exact neuronal circuit by which the signal of the, the fact that the female has been mated and that reproduction has started is transformed and is coming from the uterus through dedicated neurons 
up to the central brain of the fly. And so we can trick the fly, for example, to think it's mated by changing the activity of these neurons and making it eat more salt or more yeast. But what's going on in the brain when now this brain, when these neurons tell the female brain, hey, you're now pregnant, you should eat more yeast and salt. What changes is taste, which is the taste preference. So if you compare taste preference for salt between virgin and mated females, and we use here preference assay, which relies purely on taste in flies, what you see is that only the mated females will show a high taste preference for salt compared to the virgins. So what's changing is really that now the females prefers to taste and eat therefore also salt. And this is something which is seen in all animals, including humans. So in this study here, uh, these, uh, the, the, the authors have compared the salt preference of pregnant women with non-pregnant women. And what you see is that most of the non-pregnant women prefer the taste of a low salt solution. Whereas the pregnant women, they actually had the pre pre preference for more salty taste solutions, meaning that they preferred food which was more salty and therefore also ate more salt because salt has a positive effect on reproduction. So one way to think about that is what happens when animals and also humans become pregnant is that their sensory world, their sensory perception is changed and that reprograms then the organism and humans too very likely to now prefer nutrients which are positive for the reproductive act of producing an embryo. And now what we're trying to do, and that's again something you can do with invertebrates, is we can now put a fly which is eating while she's alive under a fancy two photon microscope and look at the brain of this fly while it's tasting salt, while it's tasting protein, while it's tasting sugar, and compare how the activity of the brain in this fly changes when it's mated or when it's not mated, and really understand what changes in the brain of these animals. And now in my last slides, I would like to highlight another effect, another player which we have identified uh, four years ago. So one thing which we have realized over the last 10 to 20 years as a community of biologists is that the microbes which we have in our gut are really an important factor changing how our brain works and this is also the case for animals, where the microbes, the microbiome in our gut, changes the brain. And how does this now relate to feeding, feeding decisions and reproduction? And again, through multiple studies over the last years, we have identified two gut bacteria, which are normally present in the uh, gut of the flies, but also can be found in humans, Lactobacillus and Acetobacter pomorum, which together exchange metabolites and enter in this circular metabolic kind of regime. And that allows now this, this community of bacteria in the gut of the flies to produce amino acids. And these bacteria will then give these amino acids to the female, allowing the female to produce eggs, even if the diet of the host is low in amino acids. But not only that, through a mysterious mechanism which we haven't kind of understood yet fully, we have shown, we, 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 we can see that the Tectobacter pomorum, this specific bacterium here, also somehow talks to the brain of the fly and changes its feeding preferences in a way that will modify its, its preferences and again change its physiology. So the gut microbiome has both a positive effect on reproduction through the production of, of nutrients and also changes uh, behavior. And we think that this is a general theme where the microbiome alters physiology and behavior through the production of nutrients. So what have I shown you today? That reproductive capacity depends critically on the availability of specific nutrients, and that somehow once animals and like those humans become pregnant, their body and their brain gets remodeled to make sure that the animals now take in a uh, higher proportion of the nutrients which are beneficial for reproduction. And so now the question is, what happens during aging? And so, so with funding from GCRLE, we have started to map out the effect of aging on female fly reproduction. And what we can see is that similar to other organisms, when, anim when females, female flies age, their rate of egg production drops dramatically, 
But not only that, as we just heard in the talk before, also the quality of the eggs, meaning how much uh, viable offspring is, is hatching from the eggs, decreases dramatically uh, at late stages of, 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 of reproduction. And so now the question is, could this be due to nutrition? Could, be, could it be that all these mechanisms which make sure that the animal takes in the right nutrients degrade during aging, and could that explain the decline in reproductive capacity? And can this be rescued if we know exactly what goes wrong by now putting back the nutrients, microbes, or other molecular players, which break when uh, animals age, and then we can rescue that. Now, I would like to end by saying that these data are obviously not only relevant for humans, right? Because it's also important for other uh, diseases, like for example, vectors uh, for, for transmittable diseases, because for example, the reason mosquitoes are gonna sting you is because the female, and it's on the female which is gonna sting you and might transmit, for example, malaria, is because this female needs to eat proteins and she's gonna get it from your blood so that they can keep a high reproductive rate. And so if we find out what's happening here in the brain and we can change that, we might also stop the females from trying to bite you. And also there's beauty in nature, which can be explained through that. So what you're seeing here is a really rare but beautiful phenomenon where butterflies will go and drink the tears of turtles. And the reason these male butterflies do that is because they're taking the salt from the butterfly tears and will then give this salt to the female when they mate so that they can make sure that the female will have a high egg production, obviously, of their offspring. But understanding these principles allow us to understand how these beautiful pictures in nature are created. I would like to end by thanking my lab, fantastic group of people, always ready to jump into the unknown. If you're interested in working with us, we always are looking for fantastic, bright people to join our adventure. And I would also like to invite us to join you in our join us in our virtual seminar series where we explore how the brain and the body interacts to make sure that the animals can keep homeostasis and also to try to understand how the body shapes behavior and brain function. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to discussing with you questions you might be having. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, that was amazing. Butterflies yeah. drinking the tears of turtles is something Isn't that, that an I will. Amazing phenomenon. <laughs> I will take that away, no doubt. Um, and yeah, it's amazing. Shang, wait. Yes, I, I, and Carlos, you... I'm, I'm sorry that uh, while you were talking about that, uh, you know, about humans, especially ladies, changing their appetites and their preference for certain type of foods seems to affect their their reproduction. Uh, you know, I I think that is absolutely fascinating. And, and you know, um, a lot of my colleagues who are listening in, a lot of us actually do see pregnant ladies and maybe ladies who cannot conceive so easily. And one of the things that I did advise them is please cut down the sugars for those who want to conceive. And then those who are pregnant who say that, oh, my, my taste buds change and everything else. And now it seems that there is a biological explanation for all this. Uh, you know, so do humans really uh, adapt their food choice to their reproductive state? Well, that's, you see, so one thing which is really fascinating is that while our cultures are flooded with anecdotal uh, accounts of these changes, there's actually really little, really hard data on these changes uh, in, in humans. And actually, the example I showed you, which is this change in soul preference, is actually one of the really well-documented and reproducible um, phenomenon which has been shown in taste perception upon uh, in pregnant women. There are, they, there are studies looking into other types of preference changes and so on, but to be very honest, the literature is very confusing because some studies find changes, some studies don't find changes. And I think that, that, that to really understand what's going on there, one needs to really get that uh, mapped out really well. To be honest, it's really a daunting task to do that in humans. Um, these, yes. these, these preference change tastes are different. And obviously, there is also a limit to the ethical abilities we have in doing this type of test also in pregnant women. That's also why these model organisms are very, very powerful. And, 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 and one other thing which I didn't mention is, and that is something I find very fascinating, is that the body and the brain changes its preferences 
in anticipation of the needs, right? So it's not like now during embryogenesis, all these nutrients are being used up and now that induces a homeostatic hunger, but the brain kind of, and the body knows what it needs and pre-programs the system to make sure that these deficiencies never end up happening. But I, I mean, as you know better than I do as a physician, these are complicated questions, right? For example, yeah. salt. Right? I mean, the, the dietary recommendation for pregnant women, at least here in Europe, is to really reduce strongly salt intake because of preeclampsia, which is one of the biggest risks mm -hmm. during pregnancy. However, biology suggests that uh, uh, salt is a really important nutrient for embryogenesis. So how do you set that balance is obviously a big, big challenge. And I have huge respect for the physicians who, 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 who walk that, that, that balance. Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer, anything yeah. to chime at this point? Oh, I mean, you know, I, Carlos, you know that I'm in, uh, deeply, intimately familiar with all of this work, and this is um, at least tangentially related to what we're interested in my lab. But um, I, what you said is really important, um, using different model systems, different animals to investigate these questions is so key. Um, and we'll get to that next week. Um, but I wanted to ask a question of Ivana, just to bring her into the conversation. Um, are there locations in the genome that are more susceptible to line one elements? Um, and are you, do you know um, what's turning them on in oocytes? Do you have some idea about what, what might be doing that? Um, so, I, I think there are some recent studies that suggest that obviously uh, changes in DNA methylation um, could be associated uh, with the deregulation of um, line one elements. It certainly things like that happen in other tissue. Um, um, definitely changes in the uh, perhaps uh, uh, um, chromatin histone marks uh, possibly at the level of the line one promoter. Um, so I think these are all the question that uh, certainly needs to be addressed, but um, uh, likely uh, the regulation will be at the level of promoter, but I don't think that we um, have to exclude uh, other uh, possible ways, for example, the regulation of the translation of uh, line one messenger RNA, things like that. So. Right. I mean, this is a, a genome instability is one of those mm -hmm. hallmarks of aging that's really shared between somatic cells and oocytes. Mm -hmm. So um, super exciting. Yes. Uh, question for Carlos. Um, have there been any epidemiological studies in human subjects that investigated the specific type of diet, meaning vegetarian or um, other kinds of diets and female fecundity compared to other other kinds of diets? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously a gigantic literature on the epidemiologically uh, correlations uh, between diet and, and reproductive success. Uh, again, these are very complicated studies because um, you can just make like kind of average overviews on, on different people. And I think there's some really, I mean, again, there's nice support for the fact that uh, protein rich diet, I mean, you need to have a certain amount of protein to really make sure that. Uh, there's a high reproductive success. Um, but most studies actually focus more on food safety, right? So that's another important aspect, which obviously is very important. So most of the food recommendation uh, for humans are focused really on that. And again, in ensuring the well-being of the mother, right? Because that's, that's a trade-off, again, which has to be looked at. I, I think the real frontier and where it's going to get really powerful to know the molecular mechanism is really when it comes to really... Uh, personalized dietary um, intervention, right? which is to really look at um, what could be kind of molecular markers for specific nutritional requirements in a specific individual, and obviously also at a specific age, right? And then really uh, kind of design diets which are then individually uh, optimal. And I think that that's when it gets really exciting. And I think we, we are seeing this at the horizon, but especially in humans, we need better, much better uh, studies on these nutritional effects. I think that's, that's the basis of all future endeavors. And that's, I think, where we still lack. Right, yeah. I mean, female reproductive health is, is so, um, it, it's so stochastic at the level of the individual too. 
Sorry, Shangwei, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, I think I think that's that's giving me lots of thoughts in my mind. I'm trying to link all this work, which I find very, very interesting. And, and there was a question uh, asking Carlos about increasing the concentration of salt, you know, or keeping the female flies on high salt weight causes any long-term changes in reproductive success. Um, because in, in, in a clinical scenario whereby, you know, you're, you're right about women with preeclampsia and uh, we will, we will really, really start thinking about, you know, stopping the salt intake because, you know, high blood pressure and stuff like that. And, and again, preeclampsia is also higher in older women, uh, which will bring back to the question of the USAC is coming that's older. And, you know, Ivana probably knows a lot about that. You know, maybe older USAC is more genomic you know, instability. Are all this actually linked together? I mean, hearing from Carlos first and maybe Ivana. Okay, so, so I mean, so that, so we haven't explored the age uh, di di dimension yet. And that's actually why we are so excited to now be part of this consortium and have received this funding, because this now really allows us to do that. Um, obviously, that's something we always were curious about, but you know, to be curious and to have the funding to really dive into that mechanistically is something different. And so that's exactly what's going on at the moment in the lab. And, and I hope that my brilliant colleague, uh, Dita Santos, is gonna be telling you more about the details of uh, how we hope to really get into that. But that's really, I would love to have an answer on long-term repercussion and effects of these dietary changes on yeah. both reproduction and aging. But uh, the few months we have been working on this haven't been enough yet, unfortunately. <laughs> Flies are fast, but not that fast. <laughs> well, well, I'll be looking out for that because I have too many queries and I need that evidence. <laughs> so you'll be the first we send the preprint to, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so so uh, we, we really have limited time at this point in time. Um, but but Ivana, Ivana, just on the last beat, uh, there was a, uh, someone who inquires, you know, how, how old are the mice? Are you going to look at the mice sites for the NAP for your analysis and activity of oh, I, I think I, I, we are looking about a, a, a 12 months, so uh, yeah. old months, which would be close to, you know, perhaps premenopausal <laughs> phase right. of, right. of the uh, women. So, um, um, I think this is this is the age that we will be looking at. I think at that age, it's been shown in a very small strain that um, aneuploidy is already observed. So um, uh, we would like to basically look around that age. But um, I think it would be interesting to um, um, actually perhaps go even earlier than that because I think uh, in uh, uh, in the mouse, I believe some lab strains even at the nine months of the age, uh, you can see that aneuploidy um, is uh, going up. And then if it, I mean, totally can speculate here that perhaps line one activity could um, insert into some regions of the genome that would impact chromosome segregation, then actually looking uh, before this aneuploid is observed would be um, actually a, a good way to do, to do that. Yes. Well, we could keep talking about this for quite some time. Um, thank you, Ivana. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, those were wonderful talks. And I recognize that there are still some questions in the chat box that we didn't get to. So we're going to move the conversation over to our um, online communication platform. So we set up a network. Uh, anyone who's interested in reproductive aging can go there to um, discuss things. And so we'll add these questions to the chats there and um, have Carlos and Ivana answer them there. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone um, and invite you all to come and hear our next webinar, which will be next Thursday at the same time. Um, we're going to welcome Berenice Benayoun from USC and Ingrid Feder Pruneda from uh, the University of uh, Autonomo, Mexico. And um, we are going to talk about this question of model systems, um, particularly for female reproductive aging. We really need some new, new ways to test these ideas. Um, so I'm excited about that. Shangwei? Yes, absolutely. And for those who are in Singapore and the Asia Pacific region, we'll be on a Friday morning. And until next then, we'll be see each other on making long reproductive longevity a reality. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and this evening. Good night and good day for everybody. <laughs>